I think we should probably get started. I'm Naomi Gerstel. I am on the Northampton Neighbors Board and Speakers Committee. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Northampton Neighbors and the Speakers Committee and then get to our main event. Um, Northampton Neighbors has been around since uh, a few years and we have over 900 members. Um, and we essentially are an organization that's part of a national movement of villages to help people who are aging stay in their homes. And we are free and open to everyone. Um, and our services are provided to everyone over 55. And we had to come to a halt for much of our services when the pandemic began, but we managed to create uh, a number of um, services that we could do that were not in person, uh, including interest groups, uh, book club, uh, uh, neighborhood groups. Um, and there was just an article about one of our groups, FIGS, the food group in the Chronicle today that you all might wanna take a look at. It's quite a good article. And um, the speakers committee went online and we've had a series of really good speakers of which today is an example. And I wanna talk a little bit, and as Nina said, all the uh, talks are recorded so you can go back and look at previous talks if you miss them. Um, let me talk a little bit about the logistics. As some of you probably know, we use chat for questions. I've posted in chat already, both a link to some resources that Mark Peterson has, has provided um, and Diane put up a PDF so you can go directly to what he provided um, if you don't want to use the link to get to it. Um, and uh, please, it would be better probably if you saved your questions till after the talk, because I might interrupt the speaker. But if you, just, if you just can't wait, just put them there and we'll come back to them at the end of the talk. Um, you will also see in the upper left hand screen part of your screen, something that says Otter. This is a marvelous techn technological um, innovation which will create, um, will, will transcribe the talk as it's being given. So you, if you have any trouble hearing or just like to read more than to listen, um, more than to just listen, uh, you can read along as we speak. Um, Mark is gonna talk for about 30 to 35 minutes and then we'll have a question and answer period. Um, so now to our main event, Dr. Mark Peterson. Uh, he is a retired psychologist who has taught at a number of universities um, and left Antioch as chair of the professional development, the psychological professional development department. I think I got that wrong. Um, and, and to start a, a clinical practice. He's won numerous awards, including the New Hampshire Psychological Association's Outstanding Lifetime Contribution to Psychology by the American Psychological Association's Outstanding State, State Psychologist in the Country, the Martha Riggs Award. And for the last 10 years, he's been doing research on uh, end of life planning. And he developed a course about six years ago, which continues to rave reviews on these issues. Um, in addition to numerous other books, publications, and reports, he has recently published an ebook called Your Life, Your Death, Your Choice, How to Have Your Voice to the End of Your Life, which provides documents, directions, information about, uh, uh, about the death with dignity movement and just general wisdom about how to think about these issues that we all have to confront at one time or another. Um, so enough said, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Mark Peterson. Thank you. I guess this is time to share screen. First of all, I want to thank Nina and Naomi and Diane for their assistance, uh, technical assistance and support. Um, uh, Naomi had a look at uh, my website and, uh, and a lot of the um, information thereon, and she actually came up with the title, which I really like, which is Taking Charge of Your End of Life Planning. And, uh, and I, I intend to try to help you understand just a bit about this. The website that I have is called um, uh, having your www.havingyourvoice.com. You can find all kinds of material there. And you can also uh, find the ebook that I wrote. 
And uh, just as a little bit of an um, introduction, um, the materials that I created um, include all of the videos. We're going to see three videos today, um, as well as discussion uh, um, options for those videos if you choose to watch them with your family or uh, your partner, hopefully with your whole family, because everyone should be in on this decision making and, uh, and deliberation. And so, uh, I have created those basically in the format that's in the book so you get a sense of how it works. Um, and um, so anyway, I wanted to just start by saying that, as you know, there are a number of different kinds of end-of-life planning. You have to have a will. Um, you probably should talk with someone about your taxes and your property. Uh, you should uh, maybe um, do some thinking about spiritually what you want uh, for yourself. and. Um, and you need to think a lot about a variety of, of kinds of things that you have to plan for. Nobody particularly likes to do this, but it's really important to do. Um, the one that, of course, we're going to focus on is medical decision making. It's probably the most fraught, the most emotional, and the most uh, unsettling. And I can assure you that because you're here, you've already begun to take charge just by being here. And I congratulate you for that. I really do. It's a wonderful thing that you're here. Um, and uh, one of the things that I have heard from people in the past is they're afraid that if they start to deliberate and talk about this um, sort of super superstitially, it's going to happen to them right away. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if that were the case, I would be dead nine years ago because I've been, I've been at this for uh, more than 10 years now. And I talk about it so much that uh, uh, I'm sure my wife gets completely uh, uh, bored with it. And my kids who are in their 50s roll their eyes. So um, be that as it may, it's not going to happen just because you're thinking about it and talking about it. So at any rate, I want to, um, Tell you what, what you can expect today. We're going to look at three videos, as I said, um, that provide examples of places where it's important to take charge. I'm going to present to you the primary obstacles you have to getting your end of life planning for medical choices under control. And I'm going to also present, present you with the resources. Interestingly, the resources are mostly in the very last obstacle, which is very, very important for you to overcome. Um, I'm going to give you a ton of examples. Um, I've had, because I've been teaching this for so long, I have many, many examples from my own um, uh, students who have come up to me afterwards and said things. Um, but right now I want to read something that was sent to me uh, within the last uh, three to four weeks. And it's a good example of how um, of one of the things that you want to avoid if you're gonna take charge. Now this is written um, by a dear friend and she wrote this um, on December 2nd. Sad news for me, this past Sunday, my brother had a cardiac arrest while out for a run. He wore an emergency contact bracelet, but we don't know how long he was unconscious before he was sound and paramedics got his heart going again. He had a stent put in uh, for one blocked artery, so his vitals are strong, but he's been on a ventilator and heavily sedated throughout. Um, and then I'm going to uh, skip over some. Here um, is a little bit more. We know that they may have caught him within 30 minutes because otherwise they cannot revive his heart. But we both know the likelihood of great brain, uh, great brain capacity after this type of event is 5 to 10 percent. We have no extraordinary treatment directive that his daughter ignored, listen to that, ignored, in asking for more measures to help him out. Understandable in the moment, but we'll be impressed now on the kids that they must honor his wishes. Um, the person that wrote this was actually the person that was granted uh, the um, medical power of attorney, but she was never contacted. Now, this reveals uh, a number of things that I think are, are um, uh, pretty critical. Um, first of all, um, it's very typical. In four and a half minutes without breathing, 
you begin, your brain begins to die. Four and a half minutes. So you can understand that when we're confronted with a situation where someone's heart has stopped beating, it's essential that if they are to be revived, that reviving has to take place very quickly. Otherwise, they may wake up, but be substantially brain damaged. So I'm going to ask you this question, and I'm going to ask this over and over again as we go through this. What matters most to you? In a situation like that, if you were uh, on a respirator, had been let's say out for, let's say half the amount of time, say 15 or 20 minutes, consider that four and a half minute uh, statistic of crunchy. Would you want to be revived? What, what kind of treatment would you want? This is the essence of creating advanced medical directives. Uh, and this is really, really a very important aspect to it. Um, the, um, the fact that the, the medical directives were not and the request for medical decision making was not direct to the correct person is not at all unusual. But for you, it's very, very important for you to make every step you can to be sure that your, your requests and your choices are honored. And in order to do that, there's a lot of work that you have to do to convey to your family what you want, to tell them where the resources are, to tell them where the documents are, and that's how you have to take charge, is to make sure. And I would suggest that on something like this, it's very important that you, um, it's very important that you uh, make as much as possible a, um, um, a very careful list of all the things that you think are important and have conversations with your family about them. So let's go to the next slide. So, Here's the things that you have to take charge of. You have to contend um, uh, with difficult emotions, as I just said. You have to ask a person to speak for you. Uh, this is called the medical proxy, or it's called the, um, uh, there's a, an, another term, which is an agent, healthcare agent. And actually you need to choose two of them because if you choose only one, and that person's out of town, who gets to respond for you? Or as in this last example, the person simply wasn't contacted. In these crises, a lot of that work can go out the window if you haven't done fairly careful work. Um, and you have to, um, you should identify two, not one, just so in case one person is out of town or traveling, the other can be responsible. In my classes um, where I have uh, uh, presented and invited people to bring in their proxy, some people have come up to me and said, um, I can't bring in my husband because I'm not sure that he's really comfortable or he would be able to make the choices that I feel I would want for myself. So it's not that you simply turn to a mate if you have one or to a friend, you have to evaluate their, their capability. Um, to, uh, to make the choices for you. There are several kinds of those uh, in effect. Uh, this person may be making a life and death choice for you by saying, no, don't do um, any further resuscitation or no, don't put this person on a ventilator, they don't want it. And that's a, it takes a strong person to be able to do that. Furthermore, it takes a strong person to be able to um, uh, to work with and talk with the family around the choices. If someone has decided that they, for example, don't want uh, extraordinary measures taken and the family is saying, oh, but we want dad to stay around. Come on, we have to do all of this. There's gonna be some very tough conversations. How you get around that? Have the conversation ahead of time and secure people's um, agreement and acceptance of what you're up to. Um, and then having the conversation, we're gonna see a video on that. And, uh, um, and that's, uh, that's very, very moving. I believe my next slide is the very first of the, um, of the videos. Nope, it isn't, I can't, I couldn't remember. Um, this video, this is an intro to this video. Um, it talks about the fear that's universal, the fear um, that is, is um, shown in panic and dependency, and it's what we will all do. But if you have taken charge, 
that's going to be minimized and easier for your family. Now, the man that does this is a man, Stephen Kiernan, who wrote a book um, which um, is called Last Rites, uh, Rescuing End of Life from the Medical System. And he actually lives up in Vermont. And um, it's, uh, it's an older book, but it's a very, very interesting book. And so what he's going to speak about here is hospice and why people don't go to hospice. So here we go. Maybe more people don't go to hospice because it's easier to resist looking at the don't know. This Especially when there's so much noise and clutter and distraction. No, what you need is another surgery. I'm in charge here and I say you need chemo. In my experience, radiation is the right answer for your thing. You know, we have this new medicine. Maybe you need to try shark's venom. We're doing stem cell stuff now. You know, a little gene therapy to take care of you. I mean, you just hear all this stuff. And it's like, okay, okay, if you can make the don't know five years away instead of five months away, okay. I'm terrified. You're the expert. I'm only going to do this once. You've seen it a lot of times. Help me do it well. Human nature, in other words. And there's no cure for human nature. Nor should there be, for the most part. And, and yet, now, we do see it coming. Oh, a guy who was a former next-door neighbor of mine is about four months past uh, a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. So what's he got? Four months more? Six? He doesn't have a year, right, for pancreatic. He doesn't have a year. Now that we know that, a little bit of the don't know is gone away. Brad knows. So even though I, I fully accept that I'm going to go, I'd love it if I had a little time to plan. I don't need years, you know, but I think a little time would be great. Um, There'll be fences that I'll want to mend because I'm human, I make mistakes like anybody. There'll be um, people I want to connect with. There'll be conversations I want to have with my sons. So, so then, then you do have some, something to give you energy and to make you think about the don't knows and how you want to get from here to there. Okay, so um, the thing that's, I think, really important in this for you to understand is it's human nature to be frightened. It's human nature to be um, uh, uh, fearful. It's human nature to want to avoid talking about this. None of us want to die. I certainly don't. And uh, I don't think any of the folks that are uh, paying attention to this are interested in dying at this point. We don't want to lose loved ones. There's all kinds of things that are going on. and. Um, what I liked about what Kiernan said was human nature, in other words, um, nor should it be any different. In terms of human nature, uh, it's our nature to be fearful and concerned about this. And so the challenge of taking charge, the obstacle to that is to recognize it's uncomfortable and go for it. Go into it, dig into it, and um, see where, um, see where you, it takes you. If we were to um, focus more specifically on the example Kiernan gave, Kiernan is talking about hospice and should I go into hospice? And he's also talking about someone who probably has cancer and he says, I don't want, you know, do the radiation, do the surgery, do whatever you have to do, just make things go away. That's very much human nature. And uh, so, um, that's what Kiernan is talking about there. And um, when we're doing that, 
the last thing I want to just comment on this is notice that he says, you're the doctors, you do this all the time, you do it for me. So what we do is we kind of have a tendency to throw ourselves into the doctor's lap and say, take care of me. And I am advocating that you need to be able to plan to take care of yourself, yourself as we go along. Um, so, um, it means really coming to grips with your mentality, and that's what we're about. So, let's go on here, and we're going to talk about um, the, what some doctors are saying about medical treatment, and I want you to uh, take a look at this. First, we talked about your fear and your uncomfort, which we all have. And um, here is um, another short video of about two and a half minutes. The system is broken from the first day of pre-medical courses at college until the last day of a patient's life. That if you're gonna be hospitalized in our facility, you bring someone with you who can serve as your sort of ombudsman, your protectorate, because we can't help it, but we're likely to hurt you. And I think of this as another unintended consequence of the technology. And I can't tell you how many times on rounds I look at my residents and I go, how many of you would trade places with that patient? And not a hand goes up. And it's time after time after time. And then I go, then what the hell are we doing here? What's hard about that sometimes is when you do try to have these conversations and do it in the best way that you know how and the most tactful way that you know how and be very open and not in any way threatening or confrontational, um, but to have people get very, very angry with you. You know, how dare you imply that my mom's not gonna get through this? One of the unintended consequences of the technology is that we don't know when to quit. And if we don't find a way to change the conversation and to change, to some degree, our focus, we'll continue getting more of the same. And I think that is the answer that anyone who is ill must employ, must say, hey doc, I am your patient. And we've got ourselves in a real bind because we don't have the patient being honest about what they want, and we don't have the physician being honest about what they think they should do. So somewhere along the way, an initiative like this is gonna be like a breath of fresh air. It's gonna be like a big beam of bright sunshine that says, let's confront these issues, and, and let's be honest about how we are gonna deal with them. It's a huge window of opportunity for us, and we need to drive a Mack truck through it. And the movements that have truly changed our society always come out of groundswell of popular opinion. Okay, um, before we go on to this example, I want to um, just take a few minutes to talk to you about the implications of what you've just seen in this second video. This video is about the problem with not having good conversations. It's also about a lot of the problems within the medical profession. And I'm, uh, I want to just start by saying I'm the son of a doctor who was, a, a, my dad was a, an orthopedic surgeon. And I was very, um, and I am very respectful of what he did and of what went on um, in the medical profession. And I want you to know that I do not in any way hold a grudge or think we should go after um, 
doctors. Doctors are caring people. They really dearly want everybody to get better. Um, and uh, so I, uh, let me start by just saying that because I'm gonna talk about some of the problems that occur. I went to a, pre a presentation where a woman got up and said, um, I, um, I am in a boutique practice. Now, some of you may not know what that is, but um, uh, in boutique practices, people are oftentimes, um, they pay a fee to have access to their doctor, to have their private cell phone number. They sometimes pay 15 or $20,000 a year just for that privilege. And then when something happens, they get pretty quick response. So she went to her physician in this practice and she said, I wanna talk about my end of life plans. And this response was, oh, we don't do that in this practice. Like people don't die in their practice, come on. Um, and what he was basically saying is we're not comfortable talking about this. Um, there's another example in a book I read um, of a, a physician who basically told a resident, no one dies in my practice on my watch. And so he kept someone alive who was, didn't want to be kept alive and had basically said she wanted to uh, be let go. Um, and a lot, a lot of times uh, physicians communicate a hope and, uh, and a voice of uh, uh, positivity, sometimes by the way they say, say things. And I, I have a, a kind of an interesting example of that. A friend of mine up in Maine uh, had cancer and he had gone through several rounds of chemotherapy and had held the cancer a day for a long time. And his oncologist said, um, I have one other chemotherapy I could offer you, but it's pretty aggressive and pretty unpleasant in terms of the side effects. <clears throat> so my friend said, well, <clears throat> how much time would I give you? And he said, two weeks. And it was gonna be like five or six months of, of treatment and a lot of misery in the process. So um, there are ways in which there's um, a tendency within the medical profession to reach for that and to try to uh, try to make that happen uh, when it really isn't necessarily in the best interest of the patient, particularly if you don't know what the patient wants. This is where, again, I'm gonna say, what matters most to you? If you could get two more weeks, but it would cost five months of serious uh, chemotherapy and side effects, would you take that? What matters most? These are the kinds of conversations you have to have. One last example um, came out of um, South Jersey, um, across, the, um, across the river from Philadelphia. There was a man, and the reason I can talk about this is because it was in the paper, named Jim Davis, who um, went in for some surgery and the surgery didn't go well. And he was, um, um, he ended up on life support. And his daughter flew in from California and became known in the medical literature as the daughter from California. Um, because she raised hell. She said, my dad is a fighter. He would never, never give up under any circumstances. And I demand that you uh, offer a more, um, more treatment to him. He will never give up. And she said she was gonna sue them. She found a doctor who agreed with her that they should continue to treat him, even though a committee, an ethics committee, for the hospital had said that life support should be discontinued because there was no chance he was going to recover. And so um, they threatened the hospital with a lawsuit. The lawsuit agreed to, um, the hospital agreed uh, to continue the treatment and they treated him for three more months. The cost was estimated to be $250,000 and he passed away with never regaining consciousness. So here again, let me ask you the question, if you were in a hospital and the doctors were saying they didn't think there was any possibility of recovery, what would you want your, uh, your medical proxy and your family to do? Would you say, make them comfortable and let them go? Or would you say, go for it, do everything you can? Do everything is a common, common kind of statement. Um, so I, I, just, uh, I just want to give that as an example of some of the legal 
and the um, uh, medical issues. And you must, form, you must obtain the forms because there are some examples of people who haven't completed the forms and then a, a medical event occurs and the person is caught, uh, is uh, badly affected by that. So uh, let me just introduce something called having the conversation. This is the third thing that you must take charge of. And this is, means um, talking with your doctor, talking with your family, talking with your proxy and telling them what matters most to you and what you want and giving them the forms you've completed to do that. There are forms that you can find online. There are forms in my book. Um, there are a lot of places that you can obtain these forms, but be aware, not all forms are created equal. Some are better than others. I have no time to uh, share that with you today. It's just, uh, it's very complicated and, uh, and it requires fairly careful consideration. Um, but coming back to the issue of having a conversation, um, it comes from a, a, a um, kind of a, a history of physicians struggling with a patient who is very sick and may pass away. And the um, doctor seeks a consultation from another doctor, tells him the situation, tells him all the statistics and the lab tests and so on. And the second doctor, the consulting doctor will say, well, have you had the conversation? Well, that's, um, that is a code for, have you talked to him about the fact that, that uh, and the family that he's likely to die? If you ever are in a situation where someone comes in after a long illness and says, we have to talk about goals of care, they are beginning the conversation by using that code word, goals of care. And so having the conversation is very critical. It's an emotional conversation. And you're gonna see that in this amazing video. It's about seven or eight minutes long, a little longer than some of the others, but we'll try to, uh, I'll try to uh, get that started now. Our next report here is one of those things a lot of American families should see because it's about a moment in life all families face. Tonight, you'll see something remarkable going on at a hospital in Wisconsin that has developed a humane and life-affirming way to face what we all eventually face, and that is the end of life. Just as remarkable as you'll see are the families who allowed Harry Smith to join them in the conversation. People come to the emergency room to have their lives saved. Resuscitation complete. Good, good. But as Americans live longer and longer, the emergency room is not the best place to begin a conversation about how you want to live the rest of your life, or even how you want to die. Do you know where you are? Tough choices about which treatments and how much treatment become a guessing game, often powered by guilt. Palliative care specialist Carrie Lapham. One family member may say, no, we need to do this. We have to, you know, we have to do everything. And another family member that is saying, we just have to make her comfortable. But that disagreement rarely happens in what might just be the best place to die in America, La Crosse, Wisconsin, home to Gunderson Lutheran Hospital. Here, an astounding 96% of the patients have a game plan for life and death. It's called an advanced directive. It starts with a very tough, very honest meeting okay. they call Next Steps. Tell me what you know about Paul's condition. He's not going to get better. And we know that. Paul, what do you hope for with your current plan of care? Uh, give me as much time as I can get. But keep me comfortable. Paul and Jean Pearson have been married 21 years, a second marriage for both. Together, they have six children. He's a 73-year-old retired architect. She was an interior designer. This is what real love and devotion looks like. If you were having a good day, what would that day be like? I'd probably be fishing. You'd be fishing. And she'd be with me. She's more important to me than anything. Paul Pearson has inoperable lung cancer. He and Jean don't want there to be any doubt about how he wants to live out the rest of his life. This discussion. So in this meeting run by Jackie Cartman, a nurse practitioner, Paul and Jean face their decisions and fears head on. We were there to witness the process, which is as emotional as it is profound. 
Paul, what worries you about your illness? What fears do you have? Breathing is going to be a problem and probably going, having to go into a nursing home. Well, what about going to a nursing home? It's being uh, stuck there. I don't want to be a burden to her. Paul is emphatic. He doesn't want to linger or suffer, and he is not afraid to say so by refusing treatment. What I'm going to do now is read through these situations. If I have a serious complication from my cancer or treatment for my cancer so that I was facing a prolonged hospital stay and my chance of living through the complication was low. For example, only five out of a hundred patients would live. I would do my treatment. It was expected that I would never either walk or talk or both, and I would require 24-hour nursing care. And it would be the same answer. It was expected that I would never know who I was or who I was with. Same thing. And I'm in agreement with. <sighs> Looking ahead to the end of life is a journey that takes no small amount of courage. And what happens in this meeting is as important for Jean as it is for Paul. And the thought of losing him terrifies me. This is really a gift that you're giving to your family. Because at some point, if they're needing to make a decision, they can go back to this and say, yes, this is hard, this is difficult, but this is what mom or this is what dad really wanted. Take a deep breath for me. One of the things they've learned here is all this talking about how you want to die, in many cases, helps people live longer and, incredibly enough, costs less. At Gunderson, patients in the last six months of life spent half as many days in the hospital as the national average. But Hamas has a PhD in philosophy from Notre Dame. He led the Gunderson team that came up with this better way to die. When we talk with patients who are getting sicker over time, and they tell us, I've reached a point where I know there isn't much more, I'd like you to keep me comfortable. The cost of care goes down because we're not taking them back to the hospital and doing all these expensive things they don't want. Some people will see this, though, and say, it looks like they're trying to talk people out of care. That's not the philosophy. We really want to understand the patient's perspective. We want to understand the patient's values. Okay. And planning ahead has another benefit, peace. When it's time to go, there is little rancor or remorse. Hello, Eva. While we were at Gunderson, we met the Foote family. Just the week before, 94-year-old Eva Foote was at a local fair. I know that what you wanted for her is for her to be comfortable. But severe stomach pain brought her to the emergency room. Eva had a life-threatening blood clot in her intestine. The Foots, like so many others here, had an advanced directive, which meant they had a road map which led them to forego surgery because doctors found Eva's chances of regaining anything close to her former health were next to none. Your parents let you know ahead of time what they wanted to do. Yes. Knowing ahead of time, it, it, it takes a load off the family. <laughs> Two days later, Eva passed away peacefully, her wishes honored. For Paul Pearson's children, the plan was tough to take at first, but now that they know what he wants, they have accepted it. You know, it just, it does put everybody at ease. To know that there is this plan in place. Yeah, it really does. All of us can be pre prepared for each step as it comes. The Pearsons don't feel like victims of their circumstances. In fact, just the opposite. The process has helped Paul decide how he wants to live the rest of his life. On the schedule, more fishing and historical reenactments. Gene and Paul have been going for years, and now is not the time to stop. How helpful is it to have these conversations, to go through the scenarios ahead of time? This gives us that advantage that 
we don't have to be second guessing. What, what should I do? We've already made those decisions. And they're hard decisions, but we're okay with them. Okay. Our thanks to Harry Smith, but also to Paul and Jean Pearson, who we happen to know are watching our broadcast at home tonight. They allowed us to join in their life-changing conversation. Thank you on our behalf for sharing your bravery. So, um, that's very emotional. I find that I oftentimes tear up when I watch it. And I've watched it dozens and dozens of times. Um, but the reason it's, it's so moving is because they're so honest. And I think it's really important to understand and recognize that by doing this and taking charge of uh, your end of life, you're going to be making it possible uh, for your family to know what you want and what matters most to you and feel not in doubt or guilt or um, fear about what is, um, what is at stake here. Um, and so I strongly urge you to engage in these conversations. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. I think I've provided some in the handout. A lot of times it's as simple as saying, let's say, show this and say, what would you want if you were told that you had inoperable lung cancer? What would you want for yourself? And how would you want it taken care of? And you can ask that of an 18-year-old or a 30-year-old or a 50-year-old or a 70-year-old. People will have different responses. People's responses will change over time. But it's really important for you to um, take charge of that. You have to get the forms and you have to designate and choose who is going to be your proxy. And you have to complete the forms. And I am under, underlined and complete them because I have students who contact me two, three years after they've taken the class and say, I finished. Um, and uh, I'm always delighted to hear that. But there's a terrific opportunity for inertia. Uh, and it's easy to occur to just put them to the side of your desk and say, well, I'll do that next week or I'll do that tomorrow. And of course, having a serious conversation. And if you notice, then I put a red S in conversations because it's not one conversation. The example that I read at the beginning um, uh, was one where um, I believe there was one conversation about what this gentleman who died of a heart, heart, heart attack um, uh, had had. It's not enough. They have to know where your forms are. They have to know your choices. And it's very good to have a particular location that everybody knows, not please in a safe or in a safe deposit box because they're virtually inaccessible to just about anybody. They need to be on top of your refrigerator in some sort of a plastic folder that can easily be grabbed uh, and grabbed by the EMTs. That's where EMTs are gonna look if there's um, um, something that brings them to the house because of a ser serious medical event. So I'm gonna close with that. I think I've run just a little too long, I apologize. And um, I think we should do questions and answers. Okay, so um, it is hard. It's hard. It's hard to move on from these kinds of issues, and we'll move back to them in a minute. In a minute, but I first wanted to uh, make a couple of announcements. This is a, um, our next two speakers. Um, uh, February twelfth will be Carrie Baker, who will talk about what we should we do about the Supreme Court. And on February 26, Doug Amy, who will talk about America, the country that democracy left behind. Um, we invite all of you to those talks um, and look forward to seeing you. All our talks are every other Friday for an hour at three o'clock. Um, and now something that none of us like doing much, but we have to do a little of. Uh, Northampton Neighbors is a, a not-for-profit organization that charges nothing for its members, relies on volunteer help, and if you could donate to us, we would we would very much appreciate it. And to do that, go to our website, um, www.northamptonneighbors.org, and you can contribute uh, with a check through PayPal or credit card. Uh, and now let's turn 
to the next part, which is questions and answers. And I see that there are a lot um, of questions in the chat, com mostly comments in the chat. Um, do you want to go through them, Mark, or should I go through them? And I, I would prefer that you just throw them at me. Okay, so some of them, everyone should look at them because for many, many of them are um, from people who are talking about um, other people you can talk to, other sites you can go to, um, other states um, that have them, have various ways of responding, perhaps better ways of responding to um, these situations. Um, I, think, I think the first question is from Joanna Ruth. Um, who writes, these choices look clear to me. My questions have to do with times when I'm not in a life or death situation, but before that, making choices get it, given that I'm chronically ill, but with no threat to my life, trying to make these decisions before the fact I need some help with how to fill out a MULST form without a real emergency. Sure. A MULST form is called the Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. It's basically a um, what I would call a um, an executive summary of your advanced medical directives. It has to be signed by your doctor, and for that reason, it's a really, really important form to complete. It's one page um, in the um, in the state of Massachusetts. It's yellow, bright yellow. They're oftentimes a bright color, partly so they can be seen in um, in the midst of a panic about what's going on. And uh, what you need to do is to obtain that form. You can usually get it from your physician. You can get it online, um, download it, uh, fill it out, and then take it to your, um, uh, your physician and have a conversation. That's the first conversation that you, uh, you need to have. Um, and indeed, you need to have that conversation also with your family. But once your physician signs it, it's an order and the EMTs and the hospital knows what you've decided. It's a very, very good question, a very important thing for you to do. Okay, the next question is from Julie, who writes, a while back, a lockbox was offered that allow access to the police. I can't remember who offered that. Does anyone remember how to connect with that program? I, I know nothing about that. The sheriff. Hampshire County Sheriff um, Chad. had a program through oh. the, uh, are you listening to me? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, the Senior Center in Northampton uh, had a sheriff came in and worked with elders to, uh, to install lock boxes, Hampshire County Sheriff. Contact them. Okay, terrific. Okay, so that's a local program, and that's good. And now a question from Catherine Baker, who says, where can we find access to the advanced directives form? There's a lot of different advanced directive forms. Um, I actually, uh, in, the, in, in my book, I have a whole chapter on how to choose a form. Uh, forms vary a lot. Um, you can get them online. Um, there's one called Five Wishes, which is a quite a popular form. I don't happen to particularly feel comfortable with it because the form basically focuses um, on uh, uh, giving a lot of power to your doctor to make the choice. And, um, and your doctor, in many cases now, doesn't end up in a hospital because they don't have hospital practices. So I, I'm a little worried about that form. Um, becoming out of date by the change in the hospital practices. The most, the most important forms that you have to make are um, uh, choices you have to make are on forms that give you 12 choices for everything from CPR and um, ventilation and um, food and nutrition to treatment for cancer and uh, treatment for certain kinds of infections. And so it's, a, it's fairly complicated and and uh, you, you need to be able to think some about your, your own particular choices. Um, for example, if the probability, as was said in one of the, uh, uh, um, in the last uh, video, 
if the probability of, of getting better is only 5%, do you want to have aggressive treatment? Um, so I would suggest that um, you go online and you look for forms. There are some that are created by uh, the Bar Association. Um, some of those forms, the Bar Association form in Pennsylvania was terrible. Um, and gave very, very little opportunity for you to make comments or to put, uh, put special wishes in. Um, and you need a form to give you that opportunity. So you need to look a bit for those. I'm sorry I can't do more with that. I wish I could, but there wasn't time in this, uh, in this particular context for me to do that. But there is a link on, uh, uh, that you can go to on chat to find um, various resources, including Mark's book. Um, right. Also, there are several um, uh, chats from Chad, who's saying support the current bill for death with dignity, and uh, Rachel Naismith, who's saying, please tell us how we can support this bill. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question, because I'm on the board of the Western Mass death, death with Dignity, which hopefully soon is going to become the Massachusetts Death with Dignity Board, not the Western Mass um, Death with Dignity Board. And if you go to uh, type into your search, uh, Western Mass Death with Dignity, you'll come to our website and there's a place there where you can make donations, but you can also sign a um, petition, which we're uh, trying to accumulate signatures for to give to the legislature. We almost had that bill passed this year, but we ran out of time because of all of the COVID legislation that the legislature was having to work with. But um, Please sign it. Um, please contact your children and have them go and sign it. Um, please contact your uh, legislature, uh, legislators and say, we want you to support the End of Life Options Act. The End of Life Options Act will give you choices um, if you have less than six months to live and you're in impractical pain. It's not death with suicide, it's medical aid in dying. So um, thank you for asking that. I'm so glad that you did. I was going to be doing that commercial at the end. Um, let's see. Um, Julie writes, it, sorry, I'm not doing these in order because they've come, a lot of them have come. So if I'm missing you, okay. I'm sorry. And, and Chad might have more to add because he sent several, but I see his video is down and you did talk about the bill he raised initially. Um, uh, Sherry Butler Rose, any advice for the children of elderly parents who don't want to discuss complicated by dementia? Uh, that's a real, really, really tough one. Um, there is a, um, uh, particularly if they are beginning to experience dementia, their ability to focus on it may be uh, even more um, problematic. So I, um, I can only say that um, uh, you, um, there is a very excellent video that you can find at CBS 60 Minutes on dementia, which tracks a husband and wife over the 12 years of her dementia. And um, he admits in this that he was ready to take his life. He was so upset by what was going on. Um, it's uh, Dementia is a very complicated thing. And um, uh, legally, there's very, very little we can do at this point with that because we can't be, uh, you know, you, you can't do medical aid in dying with a person who is not ruled competent anymore. So you have to be protected and the state will protect you. And it's a very, very problematic issue. Um, understandably, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not advocating that because a person is, has dementia that we should end their life, but there are a couple of legal cases, one in Oregon, where a woman had said she didn't want to, to live if she was in dementia. She was 10 years in a nursing home. And um, the husband noticed that the staff was feeding her her meals because she wouldn't eat. She, she couldn't remember how to eat. And um, so he said, I want you to stop feeding her because she had put that in her medical directive. And the thing that happened was that the, um, the, the uh, nursing home, when he took them to court said, well, we put the spoon up to her lip and she opens her mouth. So she must want to eat. 
uh, his response was nonsense. That's just a um, an automatic response, like uh, a lot of uh, like little children do. And um, um, they went to court, and he lost. And um, I think he was spending eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year to keep her in this nursing home. Um, and it was not what she wanted, but the court said that the directive that she provided was not specific enough. So. Um, I think Diane just put up resources for Northampton on the chat, which has information about the lockbox that somebody asked about. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and from Julie, Julie writes, it is important not to be too general re CPR. People can come off vent ventilator. I have a great example of that. Okay. Um, you want to share that or did she want me to respond to it? I don't. I think she wants, Julie, do you want to speak up or do you just want Mark to respond? It's hard for us to see with, this is great, over 60 people came today, so it's hard to see all the people at once. If, if, if Julie wants to speak, she needs to unmute her microphone. Julie? There we are. Oh, hi. Hi. Hi, Naomi. Uh, just a quick story that captures a lot. My mother was on a ventilator actually several times, which gives you some idea of why I'm mentioning this, that people can come off ventilators. So I think we tend to have a very black and white view of ventilators, I never want to be on a machine, people will say, or be kept alive by a machine. My mother wrote me a note when she was on the ventilator. I brought her at her request a lipstick and she said, shade too deep, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think she was going anywhere at that moment if she okay. needed her lipstick. <laughs> Thank you. So that, yeah. There's a very good film that um, is a short documentary in the materials I provided to you on Netflix called Extremists. And it features Jessica Zitter, who is a physician who's a pulmonary specialist and also an intensivist. Uh, and she basically uh, it tracks her as she goes through uh, the ward helping people make decisions about ventilators. And you'll see how complicated it is, how stressful it is for her and how um, uh, problematic the ventilator is. For many people who are on ventilators, two, one of two things will happen, and particularly with COVID now, they're likely to be completely anesthetized um, and in, a, in a basically a pharmacologically induced coma because they, they're, there's, um, it's painful, it's uncomfortable, it's awkward, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, um, uh, do, uh, it's not comfortable in any way. If you are awake, you're very likely to have your arms tied to the bed so you don't pull the tubes out because mm -hmm. people want to pull the tubes out. So, um, and Jessica Zitter says basically two weeks on a ventilator and pulmonologists begin to think about a permanent, permanent tracheostomy, which is cutting, um, uh, doing an incision into the throat and putting a permanent tube in there. You'll never be able to speak again with that because air has to go up through the larynx and this is below the larynx. So Julie, I'm really glad you were able to communicate as well as you were uh, with your mom. A lot of people don't have such a uh, salutary experience or a, spite, a feisty mom. So I think we're about out of time and we try to keep to the schedule so that people know that they can set aside an hour. But there are a lot of resources online that you can, on, on, on the chat that you can see, and Diane attached it to the invitation if you want to get this. So we want to thank you for a terrific presentation. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us. And I suspect people will turn to many of the resources that you've provided. We clap, except we're on Zoom and clapping. We've just <laughs> Work Thank there. you so much. I'm so glad I was able to uh, uh, to meet with you and share some of this. It's uh, honestly a little frustrating because there's so much more that I could tell you about that there's just no time for. Um, and I am very grateful again for all the work that uh, you did in helping me do this. Um, and I would encourage you to uh, use the resources 
um, that I've sent, or you can find many, many, many more resources at my website, uh, www.havingyourvoice.com, because it's important for you to have your own voice. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>